Hello and welcome to GameSec. This time we're talking about games that have a license on them. Stuff that weren't necessarily meant to be video games, but now they are video games. Yeah, games based off movies, based off morning breakfast cereal, based off of... Celebrities, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, stuff like that. Even pizza guys, but we're not going to talk about that guy. Either. Okay, yeah. So anyway, you've got our first game, so mm -hmm. why don't you take it from here? Okay. Gremlins 2 The New Batch is based on the movie of the same name. The game was developed for the NES and Game Boy in 1990 by Sunsoft. I'm sure the story of the game follows the movie to an extent, but I don't really remember the movie so I can't verify this. The game is an overhead action platform game with two levels per world and a boss fight as the third level. For some reason, level 1 doesn't have a boss fight and this feels very strange to me. The graphics in this game are a mixed bag. The background graphics are a little flat in spots. The enemy gremlins are all one color, and usually the color is pretty unappealing. Other enemies such as bats, spiders, and tomatoes look better with more detail and color than the gremlins. Gizmo looks okay. He seems a bit fat to me though. The platforming elements in this game can be ridiculous. At times they seem almost impossible with moving platforms, conveyor belts, spikes, and electricity all in one stretch, but with a bit of effort and a ton of tries they can be overcome. Thankfully the control of Gizmo is really good which helps make the platforming a bit easier. Being a game by Sunsoft, I was expecting some decent music and I wasn't disappointed. There are some really good tunes in here and they helped me keep going when I was getting frustrated. This is a decent game for the NES, especially for a licensed game. Rambo was originally released on the NES. It kind of sort of follows the plot of the second movie and it's not a tremendously good game. You know, I thought I'd mentioned that this game exists, but it's the worst Rambo game out there and this episode is about good games, so let's move on to the good Rambos, shall we? Ah yes, Rambo First Blood Part 2 on the Sega Master System. It's an overhead run and gun and at first it seems really tough. Well, that's because it is. Your goal is to move forward, blow up huts in order to rescue POWs and collect weapon upgrades. You start off with weapons that can't shoot very far at all. You have a normal gun as well as a limited amount of explosive arrows. Upgrades include a longer shot for your normal weapon and a shrapnel for your arrow that kills nearby enemies when it explodes. There's also an item that destroys all the enemies on the screen. You'll notice that you can't turn around at all, you can only shoot in five directions. You also tend to move really slow, making it tough to get out of the way of enemy fire. Naturally, the enemies can move really fast. You'll eventually make it to the end of the level where wave after wave of enemies rush at you. At first I thought I had to blow up the wall with my arrows while dodging the enemy attacks, but no, you just have to kill a certain number of enemies and then the wall can be opened up to the next level. I like how it looks when you kill an enemy. It's almost like you're literally shooting their soul out of their bodies and that's just freaking awesome. Anyway, the game has six stages total. Does it follow the plot of the movie? Well, yes and no. You're rescuing POWs like in the second movie and round five is a city where you're blowing up police cars like the first movie, but other than that, not really. That's because this game was originally called Ashura in Japan and simply reappropriated with the Rambo license in the US. But the graphics are pretty damn good, much better than something like Commando or Akari Warriors on the NES. The music is also really catchy, it's just too bad there's not much of it. You know, I'd like to get my copy of this game autographed by Sylvester Stallone someday. Rambo 3 came out a year later on the Master System. This one is a light gun game for use with Sega's light phaser. We've talked about this game a couple times before, most notably back in episode 4 where Dave proved it was a better game than Panzer Dragoon Saga on the Saturn. Was I wrong, Joe? I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, it plays a lot like Operation Wolf, but I think it's much better than that. Unlike the previous game, this one was made specifically to follow the movie, so you're out to rescue Colonel Troutman and save all of Afghanistan from the Russians. It plays pretty well for the most part and the aim is fairly accurate. 
If you have a bomb icon that you can shoot that kills everyone on the screen and also a bottle that will replenish your life. Once the ammunition runs out, you no longer have rapid fire and you have to pull the trigger for each and every shot. But it really, it's no big deal. Overall, the game is a tad too easy, but the final helicopter boss is near impossible. There's some good graphics here and there, and the scrolling is nice and smooth. Between the levels, you're treated to stills from the movie showcasing the Master System's amazing graphic capabilities. For the time, that is. The music's fairly decent for the most part as well. All in all, Rambo 3 on the Master System is pretty fun and probably one of the better light phaser games out there. Not long after the Genesis was launched, it got its own version of Rambo 3. This one wasn't a light gun game though, but instead returned to a free roaming overhead run and gun. Like the Master System version, it made an attempt to follow the movie's plot with you rescuing Colonel Troutman and the like, but I like this game a lot more. You can run around and shoot in any direction now, which is great. You also have explosive arrows you can shoot to help you kill enemies at a distance and time bombs you can set which blow up after five really fast seconds. Hell, you even have a knife if you want to get up close and personal with your enemies. Killing enemies with your knife will help you replenish your stock of arrows and bombs. Sometimes during the game, you'll find yourself in a maze, and this slows down the pace of the game a little. But, you know, I, I like the exploration, and after a few times, you'll memorize the layout. Between the rounds, you're often thrown into a battle with a giant vehicle, like a helicopter or a tank. You've got to shoot explosive arrows at them to bring them down. The scrolling here is pretty cool looking, and it's probably the visual highlight of the game. The graphics in the rest of the game aren't bad, but sometimes they seem kind of minimal. It does have a few scenes from the movie that look alright. I like a lot of the music. I mean, it's not outstanding or anything, but the sound quality of some of the instruments used in the music is really good, especially compared to the 8-bit music we were used to listening to at the time. Some of the music is kind of silly though, and not really appropriate for a Rambo game. Unfortunately, the game is pretty short. Once you've memorized the mazes, you'll find yourself plowing through the entire game probably in about a half an hour. Honestly, I'd never seen a Rambo movie before playing this game. You can bet your ass I watched them all after I beat this. Ivan Iron Man Stewart Super Off-Road is a top-down off-road racing game. The game was first released in the arcade in 1989 and then ported to home systems shortly after. This version on the NES can be played with one to four players and as you guessed, playing with more people is always more fun. During each race, you can pick up money and nitro boosts that randomly appear on the track. After a race is over, you can upgrade your truck's performance by buying different things that will make your truck faster and easier to control. The racing is pretty slow going until you upgrade all aspects of your truck and then the game gets much more fun. The NES version has 8 different tracks. You'll race each track many times both forwards and backwards on your quest to have the most points at the end of 99 races. Controlling your truck for the most part is really good. On occasion you'll get hung up on a wall or you'll slow down going over obstacles. It's really nothing to complain about since all you have to do is fire off a couple of nitros to get back into first place <laughs> if you're not there already. That being said, the game is pretty easy and you should have no problem beating it if you have the fortitude to last through 99 races. Graphically, the game on the NES is a bit lacking, but you can make out all that is going on. The music in the NES version isn't bad. It fits the game just fine. It's a very fun game and if you don't have it, you should get it. There were other versions of Super Off-Road that did not include the Ivan Stewart license. There was a Master System version which is pretty fun to play and has some unique tracks. There's a Genesis version by Ballistic that's really good but sounds awful. It's also the toughest of all the Super Off-Road games. Then there's the SNES version which looks, sounds, and plays great, naturally. This one's got some original music by Tim and Jeff Fallen. Here's a quick look at all the Super Off-Roads together.
Well, Ivan Stewart did make a return for Super Off-Road The Baja on the Super Nintendo. In this one, you're driving forward on a Mode 7 landscape with hills and many forks in the road. Personally, I think it's pretty cool that there's actual hills in the Mode 7 graphics. Before I saw this game, I didn't even know the Super Nintendo could pull this off. Consider me moderately impressed with what they did here. It plays kind of like Super Off-Road since you're always upgrading your vehicle. Unfortunately, you're penalized for hitting ATVs, spectators, and even animals. It's not as fun as Super Off-Road, but it's still worth a few plays to see if you'd like it. Joe, you should go to the Baja more often. You've what? got a great tan. <laughs> Be quiet, man. Don't make fun of my paleness. <laughs> All right. Anyway, those are some pretty cool games, and we've got more. Uh, yeah. You, you got another I one. I do. This yeah. one's based off one of my favoriteest cartoons of ever of all time. Your favoriteest cartoon. Awesome. Of ever. Let's take a look. <laughs> Bugs Bunny's Birthday Blowout on the NES is a decent little arcade platformer game made by Chemco. You play as Bugs Bunny trying to get to his birthday party, which apparently isn't just down the block or in his rabbit hole. I'm guessing his party is across the country as you've got to go through many different types of areas before getting there. Anyways, that's good, because you wouldn't want the same damn backgrounds for every level. The levels are designed fairly well with many platforms, spikes, enemies, and carrots to collect. I thought it was kind of neat how after collecting a carrot, it creates a platform for you to stand on. This helps you to reach many places and avoid enemies. You have a mallet as a standard weapon which can kill just about every enemy and even crush blocks. This is where I have my only real gripe about the game. The hit detection is very broad and you just have to swing your mallet close enough to an enemy for it to die. There are also rabbit holes throughout which lead to bonus rooms or other parts of the level. At the end of the level you must fight a different character from Looney Tunes to snatch a very large carrot and complete the world. For some reason you can't fight Daffy Duck. All you have to do is grab the carrot to move on. There are a couple of different mini-games between levels that you use the carrots you've collected for chances at extra lives. Yeah, at certain times I wish I could skip these mini-games as they're kind of tedious and just a waste of time. The music is fairly annoying. I do like the sound of the synth in the music, but the composition of the melody sounds just like a circus. And I don't like circus music! All in all, it's an easy and fun platformer I'd recommend to anybody. Daytona USA is a great racing series by Sega, kind of based on NASCAR style racing, but it's much better than that. It first appeared in the arcades, but the first time I ever played it was when Sega launched the Saturn early during the first E3 on May 11th, 1995. Now obviously this is a fairly uh, compromised port, so to speak, but at the time, yeah, I didn't know any better, so I didn't care too much. This game was and still is crazy fun. You can choose between three courses, which now really doesn't sound like a whole lot. One of the things that made Daytona unique was the music sung by... Yeah, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. But it really did give the game a quirky feel and a very endearing personality. The graphics in this version only ran at about 20 frames per second and the draw distance was ridiculously short with lots of pop-up everywhere. But at the time, I didn't care. I mean, this game is just too much fun. I still think it's one of the best playing and definitely the best sounding version of Daytona on a home console to date. About a year and a half later, Sega released Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition, also for the Saturn. They completely remade the game from the ground up and even added two more tracks and more cars to choose from. As you can see, the frame rate is better, the draw distance is longer, and the pop-up is far less annoying. However, I can't choose the original car from the arcade, at least not in the same colors, and that kind of disappointed me. The controls are also much more stiff. But if you put in a code, you can unlock the original Daytona car and that makes this game so much more enjoyable. The game also has new music and I can't really say I care much for it. The Japanese version of the game which I'm playing here lets you select the arcade version's music. That's cool and all, but it just sounds nowhere near as good as the original Saturn version music. 
What is cool about this version is that you can adjust the time of day with a code for a little extra variety. The two new tracks are pretty cool, but don't quite have the personality of the original three. So while I'd probably rather play the original Saturn game, this version certainly isn't bad at all. In fact, a lot of people actually prefer it. Daytona USA came to the Dreamcast in 2001 and finally we had something that met or even exceeded the original arcade. It has the original tracks, the Circuit Edition tracks, and three brand new tracks. All of these are great fun to race on in this version. You've got a lot of cars to choose from and you can even customize them to an extent. The graphics are perfectly solid with long draw distances and a constant 60 frames per second. The music is great as well. And while the Saturn's music isn't in here, what is here is really good and all of the new music is fantastic. It also had an online mode, but it was dial-up only. Unfortunately, it wouldn't work with a broadband adapter. Most people like to complain about the control in this game, saying it's really twitchy. Well, it is. But there's a secret to playing this game. Always press up on the analog pad and steer around the top half of the circle and soon you'll be controlling the game just fine. This game really impressed me when it was new and I still play every track a few times a year to this day. This is the same team who would go on to make Super Monkey Ball and F-Zero GX, so you know it's gotta be good. Daytona USA came to the PS3 and Xbox 360 as a digital download. From what I gather, it's pretty much exactly like the arcade except the graphics are now rendered in HD and widescreen. It looks awesome, but the draw distance gets blurry a little ways down the road and that does kind of detract from the visuals. Still, everything looks very sharp in this game and it's a blast to play, especially for only $10 or less. The arcade music is here, but you can also select an arranged mode which is fairly close to the original Saturn version's music. The radio voices seem to be extremely quiet though, and for some reason there's no way to change it. You only have the original three arcade tracks, but there's other stuff to do as well. Definitely a recommended purchase. Here's all of the Daytonas together. Daytona 2 was released to the arcades, but unfortunately nowhere else. I'm using an emulator here to show you this, and it's not perfect by any means. Plus, it's really hard to play this on my computer, so take everything you see here with a grain of salt. But still, I wonder why this game was never ported to a home console. This would be a good game for a Left in the Arcade episode, but the emulation isn't good enough to properly represent what this game is actually all about. I would love to play a proper version of this game at home. The Goonies 2 on the NES is the sequel to the smash hit Goonies game which was only available on the Famicom. Yep, the first game was only released in Japan and looking at videos of it on YouTube, it looks like it would have been a fun game. Anyways, on to Goonies 2. The story is that you, playing the part of Mikey, must rescue all the Goonies and a mermaid from the Fratelli's hideout. What the hell's a mermaid doing in here? The game is played as an action platformer and as a first person text game like Shadowgate. It's an odd combination, and I think it works really well. Kind of like putting salt on your cantaloupe. Mmm, that's good. The game isn't incredibly difficult, but it's confusing. I say this because the only hard part is not getting lost. A lot of the doors will take you to different parts of the map, and if you don't keep track of them somehow, then you're going to get lost quickly. Thanks to the internet, you can look at videos and images that people have made of the game's map. Before the internet, your best choice was this handy book. The, the Official, Official Nintendo, Nintendo Player's, Player's Guide. Guide. It made the game playable without being completely frustrating. Even so, the game is fun to play wandering around, finding hidden doors and items to help you along the way. The control of your character is really well done and making jumps and whatnot is really easy to do. The music in the game is pretty good. It's got that great Konami sound that plays the movie theme by Cyndi Lauper and also other original music that is quite enjoyable. Graphically, the game is what you'd expect from the NES. Not bad, but I feel the character sprite of Mikey is pretty lacking. The weird part about this game is that there are no bosses. Once you rescue all the Goonies and the Mermaid, it's game over and you win. One of the better licensed games for the NES, and you should try it. Alright, 
point, and there you have it. And of course, we can't cover every single licensed game in a single episode, so we'd like to hear from you guys what you'd like to see, perhaps if we cover the subject again. Yeah. And maybe even some bad licensed games if we talk about those. Yeah, and, exactly. And I know you guys are going to have opinions because there's so many games out there that are yeah. based off of licensed products. It's just ridiculous. And in the meantime, this is our last show before Christmas, so uh, I'd like to wish you Merry Christmas from the bottom of my sack. My game sack, that is. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and we'll catch you next time. All right, Dave, it's Christmas time. It's once again time to exchange gifts. And I've yeah. got the perfect thing for you because I know okay. you, don't, you don't have one. Yeah, last year it worked yeah. out so well. That yeah. was so there awesome. You go. I know you don't have an Xbox 360. Oh, <laughs> well, this is a surprise, Joe. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, and I like how it's broken and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and no hard drive even. Huh? Yeah, oh, okay. it's just what you need. Well, yeah, what happened to it? Yeah. Actually? You know, so I mean, what what'd you give me? What'd you um, give me? Yeah, well, actually, I don't feel so bad then because, you know, my gift was, you know, I, I thought it would be kind of cheap too, but here you oh, go. Oh, Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo, which like is it? different color on the bottom. Oh, yeah. Don't worry about that. I mean, it, it, well, it was got caught in a flood, you know, and well, my bathroom overflowed one time, and it was stuck in there. Oh, dude.